Okay, so we continue with the physical architecture of the cognitive radio. Remember, we're looking at the basics of uh, cognitive radio. We'll be uh, going over these very fast, but let's try to remember how uh, things are working and what are the processes. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the signal, the environment is sensed uh, through the antenna. Those, so the signal is received at the antenna. That signal, of course, is composed of the superposition of all electromagnetic systems in the environment, in the air. So uh, that goes through first an RF filter, then a low noise amplifier. Uh, is, uh, it passes through a low noise and then mixed with the uh, central frequency we're looking at, uh, which the final selection filter is applied, and the result goes through the uh, automatic gain control, and then finally unlock the digital conversion is done. Okay, so now let's look at the details of this very slightly. So this is actually what you receive at your antenna, just a combination of all uh, electromagnetic signals, uh, where each one of these bars shows the uh, power spectral density of the received signal at that specific frequency. So it's a combination of all of these. This is the band we're interested in. So that's what I'm trying to focus in. Uh, so we're looking at the pass band, which is at a high frequency, and that's typically used for your communications. Note that every uh, cognitive radio device, and also the primary user devices, all devices are working at a different part of this part of the spectrum. So whatever frequency is available for you, you're allowed to use, you would be transmitting at a different part of it. Okay? So for this specific user, that's what I'm focusing at. So I should be able to differentiate the rest of the spectrum from this. However, all my processing is done at a very low frequency. Uh, in what we call the baseband. Okay, so somehow I should take this band of interest for the specific user and transform it to the baseband. Okay, because that's where all the analog to digital conversion and signal processing is done in your system. Okay, so the same hardware should be able to operate at different parts of the spectrum depending on which frequency is assigned to you. But the real processing is done in the baseband. So you, somehow you should take this band of interest and transform it to the baseband. Okay? So how you do that is what we are looking at. So first remember, this was the design we just showed two slides ago. So we'll be repeating this figure over and over in the following slides to remember where we were. So that's what we have received. This is what we have received at the antenna. Okay? We first pass it through the RF filter which selects the desired band by bandpass filtering the received RF signal from the antenna. And then that goes through the low noise amplifier, which amplifies this desired signal while simultaneously minimizing the noise component in that signal. So we have done the RF uh, filter and the low noise amplifier in the and remember we're trying to take this band of interest and transform it now to the basement we just selected this part we want to transform it here that's our game uh, that's our objective and the reason for doing this basement conversion is that all processing and unlock digital conversion is done easily at this baseband independent of the transmission frequency. No matter which frequency you're using, all processing can be done here. But to do this conversion, you need the mixer, VCO, and PLL, uh, voltage controlled oscillator, and phase lock loop. So now let's look at those. Now, now we're talking about this part after the low noise amplifier. Now the mixer here takes a uh, passband signal that comes from the low noise amplifier output and 
mixes it with a locally generated signal. That's actually the signal you're looking at, your central frequency, uh, with some central frequency FC, and uh, it's converted to the baseband in this manner. So that's what the mixer does. And this is done by multiplying the received signal, passband signal, with some ST signal that is at the frequency of F FC. Now to do this, you need the voltage controlled oscillator here, which generates a signal at a specific frequency, that's your central frequency, to mix it with the bandpass filter, to give it to the mixer so that it can use it to do the mix operation. So it, what this part is actually doing is actually it's creating the signal ST by which the received signal is to be multiplied. So that's what the voltage controlled oscillator provides us. And this procedure converts the bandpass signal that comes from the RF filter and the low noise amplifier into the baseband signal which we can process here later. Uh, the phase lock loop here ensures us that the signal, ST signal we're creating, is locked on a specific frequency of C and the phase is properly locked and can also be used to generate precise frequencies with very fine resolution. Okay, so from this part we've created the central frequency we want. From this part, we filtered out the rest of the spectrum, just the part we wanted, and we multiply them, and now provide it to the channel selection filter, which uh, is used to select the desired channels and reject the adjacent channels in that uh, given uh, passband. And then, going back to the figure, remember, the next step is the uh, automatic gain control, which will be followed by the analog to digital conversion. So the automatic gain control, uh, what it does is it takes the average output signal level and feeds it back so that it adjusts the gain to an appropriate level for a range of input signal levels. This, the primary reason for this is that the signal level may fluctuate, but you try to ha have the, uh, some constant almost constant level at the output, independent of those fluctuations. For example, in the case of an AM radio, uh, the received signal would fluctuate in a very extreme range, from a very weak signal to a very strong signal. If you didn't apply automatic gain control, then the uh, level would also change, and you would have difficulties in listening to that. What it does is it will have an almost constant level. So the wideband RF antenna now receives the signals from various transmitters which operate at different power levels, bandwidths and locations. And the RF front end should be able to detect a weak signal in a very large dynamic range. And to do this, you would require a, an analog to digital converter that's working at multiple gigahertz of speed with very high resolution and that is typically not feasible to be used on your uh, portable devices at least. So this requires that the dynamic range of the signal should be reduced before unlock to digital conversion and this can be achieved by a tunable notch filtering of the strong signals. One alternative approach to separate these uh, could be making use of the directional antennas, typically at the base station, for example. So you have multiple antennas that are looking at different portions of the area, different parts of the service area, the, so that the signal filtering is now done by the special domain, depending on where the signal is coming from, from which direction it's coming from, rather than doing it in the frequency domain. Okay? You have now multiple antennas. In this figure, you have two of them. Uh, that is what you would typically observe at a regular uh, omnidirectional antenna, a combination of all these frequencies, because there is a licensed F1 user transmitting this way, while another one is transmitting from here. So the signal propagates this way. 
if you have the directional antennas, one looking this way and the other one looking this way, now actually what you receive will not be the combination, but this antenna will actually receive signals originating from this region. Therefore, it will not be receiving these. So you will only have this. Whereas for this one, you will be receiving on these. This is better than actually applying the filter in that sense. And to do this, uh, you, should do beam, you should make use of the beamforming techniques. But note that to be able to do this, you should have separate antennas, which are directional, looking at uh, different directions. So this is typically uh, not very feasible to use with portable systems, with mobile devices. Uh, it's a better fit for the base stations. If you look at the architecture, uh, you could have the unlicensed band. So here, you, the vertical axis is your spectrum. You have the unlicensed band, the lic and the licensed bands. Se several, many uh, licensed bands. The unlicensed band typically would be your ISM bands. Uh, and in the licensed bands, for example, if this was, let's assume it was a technology like GSM or UMTS, whatever, there would be a base station that is for the primary network. Okay? And there will be subscribers of this primary network, those primary users communicating with the space station. If you want to set up a cognitive radio base station that is that plans to use also this frequency. Now you should be careful that, first of all, you should be able to have your cognitive radio users communicating with you over that band, but you would also be receiving signals from these primary users destined actually to the primary base station, but also received here. So you should be able to detect your cognitive radio user's signal out of it. But the more important thing is the transmission from this one should not be received here in a strong manner so that it overrides the signal from the primary uh, network. There could also be other networks, not necessarily uh, centralized networks with base stations. But for example, you could have ad hoc networks operating still in the license bands. And you would like to uh, allow uh, your cognitive radio devices to use all of these bands, if possible, of course, subject to the rules uh, for the primary users. Now, to decide which of these bands you can use at what specific part of the land, uh, you should have some mechanisms. One of those mechanisms could be not necessarily, but uh, something that will allow you to manage this could be a spectrum broker. This is unlicensed band, so as long as you abide with the rules for using the ISM bands, you can use it fine. You don't need any licenses for that. But for the licensed bands, you're using the bands of these other networks. Are you allowed to use that band at all? And if so, can you use it here and now? And it's also possible that there would be a cost of it. If, there's a, if you're allowed to use it, but there's a, a significant cost of it, are you willing to pay that cost to do that? Okay. This all could be managed by a spectrum broker. Note that this is showing only one cognitive radio base station. Of course, there will be many cognitive radio base stations in the surrounding area of the same operator. But as we have multiple wireless or mobile operators at the moment, probably we will have also multiple cognitive radio network operators. Now, each one of those cognitive radio network operators racing with each other to serve the customers, subscribers, and acquire uh, some money at the end of the month. Now, who uses which frequency at which location? And also, at the end of the month, you should be able to understand 
who has used which frequency at which location, and how much money should be acquired from the subscriber, and how much of that money should be kept by the operator, whereas how much should be paid back maybe to the primary uh, network operators if you have such a business model. The business model itself is yet another discussion that would be typically out of our scope. But you have to be able to manage this in the technical side. Uh, so this is actually discussing uh, most of the stuff uh, we have done, we have discussed. So that's what uh, we're trying to reach at. You should have a primary network access here. At the same time, some cognitive radio access, which could be in ad hoc or centralized manner. In, a, uh, in this one, it's totally ad hoc. Here it was using an infrastructure. So it could be infrastructure-based, ad hoc-based, or a mixture. You could have extensions, like this subscriber and this one. These are too far from this cognitive radio base station. So maybe you could extend the service over this one, if feasible. So there could be different approaches. How do you manage all these while considering other cognitive radio network operators? So for, at the architecture side, you should be looking at the primary network in which you have the primary user and the primary base station. The cognitive radio network in which you have the cognitive radio uh, equivalence of these and also a spectrum broker. The primary network would be the existing network infrastructure or maybe not infrastructure based but ad hoc based which has exclusive access rights for that spe uh, specific part of the spectrum. That part of the spectrum belongs to that one. This could be mobile networks as well as TV broadcast stations and others. Note that for the case of unlocked TV broadcasting, it's over in US, it's over also in Europe. Uh, Turkey is trying to still uh, vacate that banned uh, for unlocked TV transmissions, but still there are other digital TV transmissions and radio stations, whatever, all those uh, going in. So uh, they could be used for such purposes. Uh, the primary user, or also called the licensed user, has the license to operate in that spectrum band. Maybe not the user directly, but the uh, service provider for which that subscriber is subscribed to. And this can only be controlled by the primary base station and should not be affected by the operations of any other unlicensed users. One very important thing is that primary users and also primary, primary network operators do not need any modifications or additional functions or additional hardware so that it can provide coexistence with your new cognitive radio system. Unfortunately, there's some papers in the literature which work with such, um, uh, such assumptions, but at least personally, I don't see them very uh, meaningful, let me say, because you cannot, no, assume, now I'm a GSM user, UMTS user. You cannot come to me and ask me to make modifications on my device. First of all, you cannot ask me to buy a new device because you want to have secondary access in the same network. Why would I pay more to buy a new device? I may not be even willing to download a new firmware upgrade, even if it's free, just to serve you. If there's no benefit to me, why would I do that? You should either set up a very good cost model, which would be in the benefit of also the primary users, to do it, or otherwise nobody will do it. Even if you have such a model, still it would be very difficult to do that transition. That would be a quite painful process to have that transition. Okay? So whatever you design in cognitive radio networks, do not assume that primary networks also collaborate with you. The primary networks 
were designed several years ago by, when no one was talking about cognitive radio networks. And they're now deployed. And they're working. As long as they're there, you have to be flexible yourself to cope with that. But don't expect collaboration from the other side. The uh, primary base station is now a fixed infrastructure component that's managing that licensed spectrum, typically a BTS connected to the base station controllers. It does not have any cognitive radio capability for sharing. It assumes that it's the only owner of that band, and everything else should be some acceptable level of noise. So as long as you remain in the noise level, OK, you can exist there. But there's already noise. Don't forget that. So the real noise plus your transmission should still be under the noise floor. You shouldn't exceed that. It may be requested to have both legacy and cognitive radio protocols for the primary network access of the cognitive radio users, if you can have it. Maybe you can have it at the base station side, but it would be very difficult to have it at the user side. When you look at the cognitive radio network, of course we have different names for this. We'll leave it with a single name. Uh, you, can, you hear different terms. They're not exactly equivalent, but they're very close. So for the sake of this course, we will assume they're the same thing, though they're not exactly the same. So instead of cognitive radio networks, you may hear that people are talking about dynamic spectrum access, and networks of that would be dynamic uh, spectrum access networks. You hear the term secondary network or the unlicensed network. Now, these dynamic spectrum access networks typically do not have license to operate in a desired band, at least not permanently. You may have temporary access rights in a secondary access basis. So the spectrum is allowed only in an opportunistic manner. Look for the spectrum holes and try to utilize them. The cognitive radio networks can now be deployed both as an infrastructure network and also if possible, as an ad hoc network. But of course, uh, although we mentioned the ad hoc networks side of it, ad hoc networks, even in dedicated uh, parts of the spectrum, that's a difficult topic. As the research community, we have been working on ad hoc networks for several decades, and there have been many, many proposals. But if you look at the real deployments, you don't see many deployments. Most of them have been mostly trial or for military purposes, uh, or in cases of disasters, where you have no other option. If there's no other option, then ad hoc becomes an option. But when there's the infrastructure-based network as an option for the regular civilian life, unfortunately, ad hoc networks are not working well. So ad hoc, ad hoc network is a problem on its own, Cognitive radio networks, that's also difficult. It has also been a decade in cognitive radio networks, and still we don't have a real working system, except for trials. So cognitive ad hoc networks is a big problem. So in terms of academic research, yes, we can work on it. But do not expect a viable solution in near future except for, as I said, military applications and disaster cases, where all the infrastructure has failed, then in that case, what we mean is uh, communication for very important cases. So it's not like there are millions of people who are trying to access their Facebook accounts. That's not the case. So you're either trying to provide communication between the troops or in the case of a disaster, communication between the help organizations, that's limited communication between limited number of nodes. In that case, it is manageable. It's not manageable for millions of people. Uh, the cognitive radio user or the secondary user has no spectrum license. So additional functionalities should be there so that it shares the licensed spectrum band. 
besides, although it's not written here, we're always talking about being opportunistic. Well, to be opportunistic, you should be able to sense the channel. How do you do the sensing? You either deploy fixed sensors in the environment, which would be very costly, because the cost of the device is one uh, factor, but that's not the important one. The more important thing is you need many of these, and these will require power. So how you provide power to so many different devices all spread in the environment, and also these will ne need uplink to a fusion center or base station, however you call it, to send their measurements. That would also be another cost. I'm running out of spectrum, and I need, I still need spectrum to relay my information, my measurements to the fusion center. Okay? So it's not, especially uh, if you consider the number of nodes to be deployed and providing power to all of these nodes. Uh, well, you may have some fixed nodes, but it is always a wise idea to make use of the existing cognitive users as the sensors, because they're able to communicate over those bands. That means they're able to receive signals, which means they're able to sense. So why not use, the, for example, the cell phones of the cognitive radio users as the sensors? But then my phone works both as a communication device for me, but also it's helping the network itself, the cognitive radio network, by making sensing, probably with my permission, but without my intervention. I don't need to press the sense button all the time. It's automatically doing measurements, and when necessary, it's relaying the information. Okay. The base station should now be a fixed infrastructure component, again with cognitive radio capabilities, and the base station should provide single hop connection to cognitive radio users without uh, who do not have the Spectrum Access license without requiring that. And through this connection, the cognitive radio users can access other networks. Typically, the base station would also be the place where you do that fusion of the information acquired from the users, the sensing information. Since all these devices are communicating with the base station, the best place to place the fusion center would be at the base station. So in addition to uh, providing communication with the cognitive radio devices, these base stations, in the case of cognitive radio networks, these cognitive radio base stations should now be more intelligent than the regular base stations you know, which can manage this sensing operation, telling who should listen to which channel and when, manage pulling back all that data to the fusion center, and then making intelligent guesses about the real use of the spectrum. Which part of the spectrum is in use and which part is not. And from that, also be able to predict the near future. With the received signal strengths, with the measurements, you can somehow calculate what part of the band has been used, but it's over, it's in the past. It's a near past, but it has passed. If I have detected that frequency F1 was used one second ago, will it be also in use in the next second? Can you tell that? That is some prediction, and you should be able to do that. If you know that in the past 100 seconds, it was in use. You may, maybe, depending on your uh, algorithm, you may estimate, you may not know, but you may estimate that it will also be used in the following second. But if it was free and it was used only in the last second, 
Now, how about the next second? Was that the beginning of a long transmission or not? Maybe by looking at the past, if I have seen that, the user comes in an intermittent manner, or maybe in a periodic manner, and uses the band for only a second, and then leaves. And I've just seen that it is used for a second. Now, I may feel more safe to say, probably it will not use it in the following seconds. So all these have to be done now at the base station. Why at the base station? Because it's the base station that decides which channel should be used by which user for the following second, for the following time unit. When I say second, it's actually time slots. Okay? So I should be able to do this in a very fast and correct manner. Because it's always at the responsibility of the base station to say who should use which frequency, and if it has, if it has made a mistake, then it would be the fault of the base station. Okay, so now the base stations in cognitive radio networks are quite different than what we have already seen in the existing mobile networks. And the spectrum broker, as the name explains, it's not a required part of the network, but it could be an approach. That's why I'm explaining that. It could be a central network entity that plays a role in sharing the spectrum resources among different networks. Now if you have many cognitive radio users, but also multiple cognitive radio operators who are trying to serve these users, if you give the spectrum, remaining available spectrum, always to the same operator and the other one suffers, that wouldn't be fair. If you make them share equally, what if this one has more subscribers and this one has less? That means you're favoring the second one because it can now provide better quality of service compared to the first one. So uh, how you manage this would be a part of the spectrum broker. Okay? And there could be different approaches. For example, many people approach this problem as a game theory. Now, there, there's something like a market. Spectrum broker, for example, could be serving as the market manager. To this market, people are bringing their goods to sell. Here, the goods are the part of the spectrum for which you have the license. Okay? And there are also some buyers. These buyers are now the network operators. And they decide whether they should buy a spectrum band or not, depending on the quality of the band. And typically on the probability that that band is going to be available. If you know that some, this part of the spectrum is rarely used, while this part is frequently used, you might prefer this part, although the bandwidths are equal. Okay. Uh, and if something is cheap, would you really buy it? Like, if I give you the bread for free, would you really take it? Even if it's free? In the case of Turks, it might be. The answer might be yes, but it actually depends on your needs. If you already have bread at home, you don't want to get a new bread and carry it home, although it's free. Okay, so uh, there is some good given for some price, and you look at your needs. What are my, what's my expected utilization in the following hour or day or minute, whatever your time unit is? If I need, if I expect to require a lot of bandwidth, I might be willing to pay more. If not, even if it's free, I don't want it. Okay. So the, 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 there, there could be, you could set up such a market, and the spectrum broker could be managing this. Okay. Uh, and as I said, many people have proposed different approaches for this. By the way, some have also assumed that the buyer is not the cognitive radio network operator. 
but the secondary user itself. That could be also an option, but the problem there would be, first thing, uh, typically that would be slow. So when you try to use a band, you immediately want it. You cannot go through an auction. You don't have time for that, especially if you're doing a handoff. And the second reason would be, well, to enter that auction, you need some communication channel. What's that channel? That would also pose a problem. Also, some people have considered using uh, game theory uh, techniques, for example, for power management. That's, again, a different approach. But again, the delay there could constitute a problem. You should cons uh, look at all those. Uh, yet another problem here would be something we have uh, worked on with my PhD students, uh, Salim and Evren, and that would be you have, uh, assume the broker system I explained, at the end of the day, you have uh, provided the spectrum that belongs to company A to your subscriber. So since you have made it available, you earn some money, but you owe it to company A because the license for that band actually belongs to company A. But the, at the end of the day or at the end of the month, when it's time for paying the bills, it's possible that the subscriber denies it used it. It's possible that the subscriber pays the uh, fee, but the network operator denies against company A that it has made its band available. How does company A know that operator has made it available to the subscriber? And how can it prove it? Because all this thing is going encrypted, it's just a signal. So how can you claim that it was me and my subscriber who used it? That's a difficult task. Uh, so there are different parties. The cognitive radio user, the cognitive radio network operator, and the frequency holder, the owner of the license of the frequency. Okay? So how do you manage all this in a way that no one can cheat, can cheat the other. We have a proposed solution for that. So that could also be one of the problems you might be looking at. So as I said, you can have a cognitive radio network access where the cognitive radio users can access their own cognitive radio base stations based on licensed and unlicensed bands. You can have cognitive radio ad hoc access, in which case the users are now communicating with other users without any infrastructure in an ad hoc manner, again using licensed or unlicensed bands, and there is meanwhile an ongoing communication in the primary networks. Uh, and the cognitive radio users may, depending on how you design it, the cognitive radio users can also access the primary base station through the licensed band, so that would be like a temporary subscriber working over the primary network if it's allowed. That could be yet another approach. Uh, you can classify uh, this, uh, these approaches according to whether they're using the licensed band or the unlicensed part of the spectrum. In the case of licensed band, there is a primary network operating defined by its base station and several subscribers around. Let's consider only one of those primary users communicating with that primary network base station using the licensed band. And in the same place, you're trying to deploy another network over the same frequency band in approximately the same geographical area with your cognitive radio base station doing dynamic spectrum access with your uh, cognitive radio devices. And the communication bet between these devices and the uh, base station would, of course, hamper the communication between these primary users and their primary base stations. 
On the license band, temporarily unused spectrum holes exist in the license spectrum band, depending on the place and time. Cognitive radio networks can uh, exploit these holes through cognitive communication techniques, which means first you have to detect it, then you don't forget that what you have detected is always for the past, though it's near past. From the past, you try to predict the future. By predicting the future, you decide to use or not use that band. And while using it, you sh should keep on sensing to see if your prediction was successful or not. If you're stepping over a primary user's communication, you should immediately stop communication and switch to some other available bandwidth, if you can find it. If not, keep silent. Uh, so in the figure, the cognitive radio network coexists with the primary network at the same location and using the same spectrum band. The main purpose of the cognitive radio network would be to determine the best, or close to best, let's say, available spectrum. And the, in the licensed band, the cognitive radio functions, bless you, are aimed at the detection of the presence of the primary users, as you mentioned. And the channel capacity of the holes depends on the interference at the nearby primary users. Also, the band of the, uh, bandwidth of the hole and also the duration for which you're allowed to use that uh, hole. Interference avoidance with primary users is the most important issue here. That's also being defined by IEEE 802.22 standards. Uh, if primary users appear in the spectrum band uh, used by that cognitive radio user, the cognitive radio user is expected to vacate the band at most in two seconds, uh, possibly do it even earlier. So that requires spectrum handoff. We're used to the term of handoff, but handoff always meant mobility for us. You do handoff because you move from the coverage area of one base station to the other. Now, it's possible that you're stationary, you're not moving at all, but you were a secondary user, and the primary user starts communication. You detect it, and now you have to change your channel. So this is different from that. In the case of unlicensed band, you have, again, a cognitive radio network operating at a specific unlicensed band. You will have another network operating there. But this is unlicensed band. You cannot tell the other company to shut up. They will also communicate. Now, how do you coexist with the other one? That's now a major problem. Actually, this is what you have been experiencing, even with Wi-Fi. You set up a Wi-Fi network at your home, and then your uh, uh, sorry, neighbor also buys a Wi-Fi access point. What happens? You hope that that neighbor is using a different channel in Wi-Fi. Well, the best you can do is you can talk to the subscriber and show, uh, sorry, to your neighbor, and show how he or she can adjust the uh, band of the uh, access point so that they don't coincide. But you have only three such bands, remember, 1611. Then another one comes, okay, with three uh, neighbors, with two of your neighbors, altogether three, you can, uh, you know, one works at one, the other at six, and the other at 11. How about the fourth one? Just if you're living at an apartment complex, just do a search and see how many subscribers, uh, how many different SSIDs you see around. Typically in Istanbul, around 30. Don't forget, there are also some SSIDs that are hidden. Not very much. People are not doing it so often, but it's possible. So, how do you coexist with all these? That's a major problem. And there would be ad hoc networks to make your life more miserable. Okay? One option there, again, as we mentioned earlier, would be the broker, which could manage it. Okay? So that uh, every. Now, see, if both of these try to be selfish, and they both try to communicate, then actually both of them will fail.
For example, just some uh, ideas. If you do time sharing between these, it could help. Okay? During your time slot, you use 100% of the spectrum, but then you keep silent for some time. That could be an option. Or you can do it in different frequency bands. A uses this frequency, B uses this one. Or you could adjust power. By adjusting power, you can manage that. There could be different approaches. Or I will refrain from using it, but in exchange. Well, in the case of ISM band, it's not uh, ethical to ask money for that, but it could be like, in this location, I will refrain from using this band on your behalf, but in some other locations, you do a similar thing for me. You could have such deals. Anyways, since there are no license holders in the case of ISM bands, all network entities have the same right to access the spectrum bands, of course limited by the transmission power. Similar for your Wi-Fi. You cannot transmit at very high powers. Uh, you cannot transmit at you know, several watts uh, with your uh, access point uh, while you're trans uh, because it's just uh, unlicensed. Multiple networks coexist, may coexist in the same area and communicate using the same portion of the spectrum. And you need some intelligent spectrum sharing algorithms to improve the efficiency of the spectrum usage and support higher quality of service to your subscribers. The uh, users sh uh, should focus on detecting transmission of also now the other users. Of course, here one important problem in sensing is when you sense, you may detect some transmission. Is it a primary user or a secondary user? How do you differentiate between the two? Any ideas? Power level, maybe. What? Power levels. How do you understand whether it's a primary or secondary user from the power level? If I just stand very close to you, I hear you at a very high power, but it doesn't mean that you are a secondary user or primary user. Packet headers. Packet headers. Uh, if you are able to open the headers, sure. yes. If they're encrypted, no. It could be that, pay attention. It's a different network. For example, assume that the headers were encrypted. Or maybe you don't know the uh, chip sequence, whatever, of different operators. So you may not be able to uh, detect the headers. You may not know the waveforms, whatever. Any ideas? There's a very, very simple solution. Maybe Jam knows it. You could enforce CRs to use some sort of a, you know, a specific signal in the beginning of their transmission. Like a preamble? A preamble. And if you can listen. Uh, that could be one option. But uh, it would work uh, if you can find a unique uh, preamble that does not exist in the transmission of the primary networks, for example. That could be difficult. <coughs> the solution found in, uh, proposed in 802.22 uh, is the following. There's a frame. It's a frame structure, periodic frames. At the end of each frame, each, all cognitive radio users stop and listen. No one communicates. If there's anyone communicating, that should be a primary user. Of course, this requires good synchronization. If there are multiple networks, now those networks should be synchronized. Because if they're not synchronized, the other network could, could be communicating, and you would think that that was a primary user, although it's not. And then they will think you're a primary user. So they, sh they should also be synchronized. Uh, but that could be, for example, one option. And that's the best way to differentiate between primary uh, transmissions and secondary. Uh, the, there is a similar, uh, an approach that's similar to what Jan proposed. If you know the primary network at a specific band, which is possible, you know, 
If you're listening to GSM bands, guess what technology is being used at that band? It's GSM. Look at UMTS bands, it should be UMTS. So for many bands, actually you know what to find there. Either it's free or it's the primary network you know. So you can check that signal and look at what we call the cyclostationary signal. And from that, you try to get something like a signature that identifies a primary user. Since you, now you know what to expect there, from that you can find whether there's a primary user or not. So what Jem proposed is similar to that one in that sense. Okay, So that could be an option. Uh, Anyways, uh, we have already discussed this. Uh, cognitive radio users now should be able to compete with each other, but actually also collaborate with each other if they want better or higher uh, performance. So the requirements are cognitive radio devices uh, are required to have sophisticated spectrum sharing methods. And you need some fair spectrum sharing among networks if there are multiple cognitive radio networks in the same area using the same unlicensed band. The definition of fair, by the way, is different for everyone. So you should find a solution to that. Okay? So that would be the end of the chapter on the basics of cognitive radio systems. Let's stop for a break now. And after the break, we'll start discussing sensing and then next week we'll continue in more detail on sensing. So we'll continue with the uh, next chapter, which is on spectrum sensing. This will be, again, just an introduction to spectrum sensing. Uh, next week we'll go into more details on spectrum sensing. So uh, we'll first talk about the cognitive cycle. So cognitive radio determines the appropriate communication parameters uh, and adapts to that dynamically changing radio environment. And the tasks required to do this for the adaptive operation are referred to as the cognitive cycle. As you will remember, we discussed this in a previous chapter, but that was quite a while ago. So this is the radio environment that is affected by all transmissions, by all uh, nodes in the environment, not necessarily from a single network, but everything, including also uh, noise in the environment. So from the uh, radio environment, your device receives the RF stimuli and does the spectrum sensing. With the spectrum sensing, if you detect a licensed user, then you understand that you should be changing your frequency. So you should hop to another frequency. So uh, therefore, you have to trigger now spectrum mobility. And if you come to spectrum mobility, you ask for a decision request. Also, if you want to transmit and you detect a spectrum hole, you also provide that sensing information, the holes, into spectrum decision. And with spectrum decision, you select which frequency should be used. And for, uh, you also determine the channel capacity. And using the channel capacity and the access requests from the cognitive users, you do spectrum sharing and use the channel. And when you use the channel, actually, you're modifying the radio environment when you do the transmission. And this cycle is an infinite cycle that's continuing forever. So in spectrum sensing, the co cognitive radio device monitors the available spectrum bands and captures their information, actually takes measurements. And using these measurements, it tries to detect spectrum holes. Okay? Based on the uh, availability of the spectrum, now the cognitive radio users can determine a channel. And this operation not only depends on the availability of the spectrum, but also it, uh, it's determined based on the internal and some external policies. Like you take measure especially in the case of collaboration. You have multiple measurements. Now, how do you decide whether it's in use or not? That would be one of the policies. 
Spectrum, uh, in spectrum sharing, uh, multiple cognitive radio users try to access the spectrum and the network uh, access should be coordinated in order to prevent multiple users colliding with each other while uh, communicating. And for mobility, we regard the cognitive radio users as visitors, temporary users of that spectrum band. And if the owner of the band arrives, then the visitors have to leave immediately. So that means your device should be capable of transmitting at different bands. Actually, that's also the case for even the existing networks. Like, look at the uh, existing cellular networks, like GSM, UMTS, whatever. There are multiple frequency bands. In GSM, you're given a band and you transmit in that band. Next time you try to make a call, or during the call, if you switch to another cell and have a handoff, you would be changing your frequency. But that would happen in a very narrow band. Okay? Uh, in the case of cognitive radio, we're talking about a very wide band. Sometimes you're working in this part of the spectrum, sometimes in another part. So your device should be capable of reconfiguring itself according to the current state of the channel. You have to reconfigure the frequency you're using and also all other radio parameters like modulation and others, encoding everything. Okay? And these, all these should be done on the fly. It's not like you should change uh, the frequency band so you uh, go and buy a new phone and continue your communication with that. Or you download a new firmware. Or you enter the menus and change some parameters. That's not the case. While the communication is continuing, in a seamless manner, you should be able to modify your parameters. And this capability enables cognitive radio to adapt easily to the dynamic radio environment. What are those parameters you need to change? As we said, you should be able to change your frequency, modulation, and encoding, of course, together with that, your transmission power, and also sometimes your communication technology. So a cognitive radio uh, device should be capable of working at in a very wide spectrum in different bands uh, in that spectrum. And based on the information about the environment, the most suitable operating frequency should be determined and the communication should be adjusted so that you can dynamically uh, perform a good communication using that frequency. For modulation, the device should be able to reconfigure the modulation scheme in an adaptive manner depending on the channel conditions. For example, if you have delay sensitive applications, in that case, data rate would be the most important thing for us. Okay? So the modulation scheme could be uh, enabling higher spectral efficiency, whereas there could be some errors in transmission, like video transmissions. If one of the frames is damaged, so what? Probably the user will not even realize that. Even if the user realizes that, that's not a big deal if it doesn't occur very frequently. However, if you consider loss sensitive applications, then error rate would be more important for us. Uh, in that case, the modulation scheme should be more robust, but that would mean low bit uh, rates, uh, uh, low transmission rates, low bit error rates, but also low transmission rates. Uh, for the transmission power, you can configure it according to the power constraints. If you have high power, higher power operation, uh, if it's, uh, higher power operation is not necessary, then you can reduce your transmit power. Thus, you will actually be reducing the interference you cause to the other subscribers. And this works in a mutual manner. Uh, for the communication technology, cognitive radio can be used to provide interoperability among different communication systems. This becomes an important issue. Uh, for example, uh, after uh, September 11 attacks, uh, US actually realized that 
there was no communication between the police and the uh, fire office. That was also one of the reasons uh, so many firemen died. So then, uh, not only in the US, but in most of the countries, including Turkey, uh, there were attempts in uh, somehow keeping these different groups separated, but also allowing some communication in between. So that, of course, only the uh, managers that had the permission could be able to communicate with each other. Of course, it shouldn't be like an ordinary policeman is giving orders to the uh, fireman. But there should still be some way of communicating in between, especially in cases of emergency, not going through the bureaucracy. <clears throat> Similar is true for the communication between the police and the army, whatever, <clears throat> and also the health teams. Not only at the beginning of a transmission, but also during the transmission, you should be able to reconfigure the parameters. In other words, it should, uh, reconfiguring the parameters should not require a reset of the connection. Current connection should continue. Uh, the parameters should be reconfigured such that the device is switched to a different spectrum band. Still, is, you have the ongoing connection. Transmission and receive parameters are reconfigured and appropriate communication protocol parameters and modulation schemes could also be used, changed, depending on the requirements. So, given what we need to do, now how do we do sensing of the spectrum? So the problem is how to detect the spectrum holes by the cognitive radio devices so that it can adapt itself to this changing radio environment. So looking at this cognitive cycle, now we're focusing on this part. So, uh, you need an efficient way to de detect the spectrum hole. So, for example, in this figure, uh, here you have a transmitter that's trying to communicate with this device. You have a, a primary uh, transmitter and another primary transmitter trying to communicate with this device. But there's a cognitive radio user here and another one here. So, uh, since there's no interaction between the cognitive radio user and the primary transmitter and receiver pairs. Uh, if cognitive radio user one transmits, let's say to cognitive radio user two, its transmission will also be received by this, 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 and this in this area. Okay? And that would cause interference with the ongoing connections in the primary network. So the cognitive radio user must rely on locally sensed signals to infer the existence of the primary users. In other words, before making a transmission, it should first listen to see if the channel is available. And if it is, it should continue. Now, you should take this uh, word locally here uh, with caution because if cognitive radio user one tries to estimate the transmission of uh, the, these two primary users alone, just with its own measurements, uh, the success rate in detection would be limited. So most of the better uh, detection schemes actually utilize uh, the measurements from other cognitive radio users. In other words, we prefer collaborative sensing because just depending on your position and uh, the obstacles in between and any other thing that affects the channel, it could be that you don't receive a strong signal from the transmitter and you think that the channel is not in use and you transmit. However, the fact that you don't receive a strong signal from the primary transmitter does not necessarily mean that your transmission will not harm the other party. 
The channels do not have to be symmetric. Furthermore, as in the case here, the transmitter is here. And this is your cognitive radio user. Since the transmitter is far away, the cognitive radio user might think that it will not harm it if its transmission is only in this range. However, the important thing is not interfering with the transmitter. The important thing is interfering at the receiver. Unfortunately, the receiver is closer. So the transmission by the cognitive radio user here would harm the reception at that receiver. Okay, so that's one important thing. So uh, if it can detect that uh, these, this green and orange uh, channels are in use, then it may prefer another channel, if available of course, and transmit with that. In this case, it won't cause any harm. So that would be the scenario we would be looking at. <clears throat> so the aim is to detect the primary users, but rather than the transmitters, the more important thing actually would be detecting the receivers, which is quite difficult. So you would like to detect the primary users that are receiving data within the communication range of a cognitive radio user. If the receivers here sends back, for example, the acknowledgments using the same frequency, it's good. Although those acknowledgments should be short, would be short packages, still they will be probably received by the cognitive radio users. So it will understand that that frequency is in use. However, look at GSM. How about the uplink and the downlink? Are they at the same frequency? Yes, no, no. Uplink channel and downlink channel are at different frequencies. So if this was, let's say, a base station and this was a handset, base station would be transmitting at F1 and that would apply in F2. So it would be different. Okay? So, uh, in reality, it's difficult for a cognitive radio user to detect primary user activity in the absence of interaction between primary users and the cognitive radio users. Recent research has been focusing on how to detect primary users based on local observations of the cognitive radio users from the environment. So, how do you do the sensing? There, we can classify sensing methods roughly as follows. We can try to detect the transmitter, we can try to detect the receiver, or we can look at the interference temperature management. For transmitter detection techniques, which are more popular ones, and the ones that appear to be working better, you can look at match filter detection, energy detection, and cyclostationary feature detection. So for the transmitter detection, the cognitive radio uh, device should distinguish between the used and unused parts of the spectrum and should have the capability to determine if a signal from the primary user is locally present in the uh, environment. Uh, so transmitter detection approach tries to uh, detect the signal, which could be pretty weak, from a primary user through local observations at the device. So, the signal you receive at your antenna uh, of the cognitive radio device is either anti, just noise, if there's no transmitter, that would be H0. And in H1, there would be a transmitter. So uh, there is some transmitted signal plus some noise. Where NT is typically, for example, at the white goes in noise. ST is the signal that's being transmitted by the primary user. H is the amplitude gain of the channel. So the primary user transmits ST, but it is modified by H at the receiver side, at the cognitive to radio user. And H0 would constitute our null hypothesis that saying that 
there is no primary user communicating over that channel, whereas H1 would be the alternative hypothesis which says there is really a transmission by a primary user. So for transmission, uh, transmitter detection, uh, as we said, there are three common approaches, mass filter detection, energy detection, and psychostationary feature uh, detection techniques. So we will first focus on mass filter detection. In the case of mass filter detection, you receive some signal, let's now call it R of T, which is actually the transmitted signal plus some noise. So that's what you receive at your antenna, R of T. And you take R of T and integrate it over some duration. And try to make your decision by comparing against some threshold to decide whether it's A0, null hypothesis, or the uh, alternative hypothesis. In other words, whether there is a transmitter or not. That's what you try to detect. So this is the in, uh, transmitted signal, but in the channel, due to noise and other uh, factors of the channel, the uh, signal is deteriorated. So that's what you actually receive in your antenna. And you try to apply this filter to this threshold, uh, sorry, uh, to this receipt signal, and that's what your, this integral does. It's, it's uh, doing the convolution. So uh, what you need to do here is take uh, the transmitted signal information. You need that information. And you also need synchronization for sampling uh, time. And you try to understand whether there was really uh, a transmission or not by looking at this integral, the convolution, and comparing it against the threshold. If there was really such a transmission, and then your received signal should be exceeding the threshold. Uh, when the shape of the primary user signal is known to the cognitive radio user, the optimal detector in an antivite Gaussian noise channel uh, is the match filter method since it maximizes the received SNR value. Okay? But with the assumption that the shape of the primary user signal is known. So that's a requirement. The advantage is it requires less time to achieve high processing gain to, due to the coherency. However, as is mentioned, it requires some prior knowledge about the transmission from the primary user, such as the modulation type, order, pulse shape, and packet format. So if this information is not accurate, then you find something, but you shouldn't depend on what you find. However, since most wireless network systems have some pilot signals, preambles, synchronization words, or spreading codes, these can be used for the coherent detection. What does that mean? That means, look at GSM, for example, again, as, an exa as a case. Similar thing, by the way, for EMTS. But there's a pilot channel. And also, the pilot channel is at selected frequency bands. That's actually how your phone quickly finds the uh, used frequencies in a new cell when you move to that cell or switch on your phone. Okay, So your phone is actually looking at where the pilot, pilot signals could be. So why not do it here? Okay, You just look at the pilot signals. Also the pilot signals have a standard pre uh, preamble. You can, so you know what kind of a signals you should be ex uh, expecting if there's really a primary network there. And if so, you will detect it. Now, if you detect the pilot signal, if you can open up the pilot signal, then you learn which frequencies are in use there. Even if not, at least you know there's a GSM network. So you know that GSM band should be avoided. OK? So uh, that would be one approach. But you can do this with GSM, with other 
technologies. Now, for each technology, you should be able to handle it. In the case of UMTS, it would be slightly different. If there was a Vimex network, it would be different. So for each one, you should be able to handle this. And the information you get from the pilot signal, signal you should infer something else for the other frequencies. Since I hear the pilot signal at frequency f1, I estimate that I shouldn't be using these other GSM frequencies, although you have not done any detection there. So that's something you could do. The other alternative approach for uh, transmitter detection would be energy detection. If the user this time cannot uh, gather sufficient information about the primary user signal, so you don't know the shape of the signal and other information, in that case, just look at how much energy is received. If there's really a transmission, not noise, but really a transmission, then the received energy should be exceeding some threshold. So if the cognitive radio user is aware of the power of the random Gaussian noise, then the energy detector is optimal. So to measure the energy of the received signal by the cognitive radio user, the output signal uh, of the bandpass filter uh, with bandwidth W is squared. You know, for finding the energy, you have to square the, uh, that. And integrated over the observation interval T. And finally, output of the integrator Y is compared with, again with some threshold to decide whether there is a transmission or not. So you have some input, you first do filtering, and you find your received signal R of t. Then you square it, thus you get R square of t, and then integrate it over some uh, period t. So you get this integral value, and now you compare this one against your th uh, threshold lambda to decide whether h0 or h1. So the performance is now susceptible to the uncertainty in noise power. So in other words, it depends on your SNR. The energy detector cannot differentiate signal types. We didn't look at the shape, pay attention. But can only determine if there's a transmission or not. That's all. It cannot understand what kind of a signal that was. The energy detector is prone to false detection triggered by unintended signals because all we detect is there is some transmission. I don't know whether that was primary user or someone else. Note that in the uh, previous case, if there was another transmission, an interfering uh, transmission, but not the primary user, that uh, comparison would give me H0. Here that's not the case. Anything else would also be considered as a transmission. So the energy detector requires longer sensing time. In the case of match silt, uh, filters, the duration T we used for the convolution would be uh, proportional to 1 over SNR, whereas in the case of energy detector, it would be 1 over SNR squared, where SNR is less than 1. Therefore, the denominator would be uh, smaller. So uh, the time required would be larger. And finally, uh, cyclostationary feature detection is as follows. Now, we have some modulated signals in the environment, in general coupled with some sine wave carriers, with some pulse strains, depending on how you're doing your transmission, uh, some repeating spreading, hopping sequences, cyclic preferences, whatever, depending on your transmission technology. But typically, these are occurring with some built-in periodicity. These are not any signals around. These are some intended uh, signals created by humans. Okay? So they have some periodicity. So these modulated signals are characterized as cyclostationary since their mean and autocorrelation exhibit some periodicity. 
And from this, you understand that that's not regular noise, but it's a real transmission. So these features are detected by analyzing a spectral correlation function. And the advantage of this approach is that it differentiates the noise energy from modulated signal energy. So these three methods are for detecting the transmitter. But what are the limitations introduced by uh, detecting the transmitter? There are two different problems. They're very closely related. One of them is receiver uncertainty problem, and the other one's the shadowing problem. So in the case of uh, receiver uncertainty problem, uh, there's a primary base station that's transmitting to its primary users. And there's a cognitive radio user that's out of the range. It's not capable of receiving the transmission from this primary base station. So it thinks that that frequency band is available. Note that this could be replying, but maybe over another frequency. So if downlink is in F1, uplink is in F2, even if you hear F2 at the cognitive radio user, you won't realize that actually this node is receiving with F1. And that's more important. If you transmit in F2, if your signal cannot go all the way to the receiver in the uplink, it wouldn't cause interference. The important thing is, if you transmit an F1, this guy is very close. And there will be collision at the receiver. That's the main major problem. So give uh, this receiver uncertainty problem here, because uh, you're not certain where the receiver is. OK? So it cannot detect the transmitter. And it will try to transmit using the same frequency, and it will cause interference. In the case of shadowing problem, it's also related to the hidden terminal problem due to shadowing. If there's an obstacle which creates a shadow where the cognitive radio user is, it's actually very similar to this one. It will not realize that this thing is, uh, this transmitter primary base station is using that frequency. So it will not be able to detect the transmitter and again do the transmission and cause interference. So with the receiver uncertainty problem, uh, with the transmitter detection, the cognitive radio user cannot avoid interference due to the lack of the primary user's uh, receiver's information. Moreover, the transmitter detection model cannot prevent the hidden terminal problem. In the case of shadowing problem, the cognitive radio user is located in the transmission range of the primary transmitter, but still not capable of receiving it due to obstacles. Uh, due to the shadowing caused by the obstacles. So consequently, the sensing information from other users is required for more accurate detection. That means if there were some other secondary users in the environment, if they could sense, not everyone would be shadowed. If they detected, then, and if they also relay this information to the fusion center, then the fusion center understands that there is some transmitter in the environment. And it will tell this one not to use it. But note that this requires some uh, infrastructure-based approach. So if you compare non-cooperative and cooperative detection, uh, if you try to classify the detection methods according, uh, if you try to classify according to the detection method, this we all did that. We can talk about match filter detection, energy detection, and cyclostationary feature detection. Whereas if you look at according to the detection behavior, you could be using any one of these. But do you do, you do it in a non-cooperative manner or in a cooperative manner? In the case of non-cooperative manner, you're on your own. Every node decides uh, by its own local measurement. In the case of cooperative detection, you have information from multiple users so that if you don't hear it, hopefully one of your collaborating neighbor uh, cognitive radio users will detect it. And by looking at the measurements from many of them, the base station or the fusion center may make a better estimation. Thus, you mitigate multipath fading and shadowing effects. 
So it improves detection probability in heavily faded and shadowed environments. Typically, uh, that's what you observe inside the city. Uh, the problem with cooperative detection is this: uh, the good side is, yes, it provides better detection probability. The bad side is it has some overhead. Now it requires that you're periodically or at least frequently uh, sending your measurements to the uh, fusion center. And how you do that is yet another problem. Because to do that information transfer, actually you need some band, frequency band. But I was already running out of frequency band. So that's yet another problem. Uh, you could work with different approaches. Like you might say, well, if you don't hear anything, why talk? Only the nodes that uh, exceed uh, that sense something that exceeds the threshold do the transmission. So uh, this is approval by silence method. If if you're silent, that means you say there's nothing. You talk only if you detect someone. Some approach the other way. They say, well, if there's someone. Then you talk, it's, and if you uh, no, remember, let me take it from the beginning. I said, the problem is that uh, you need a channel to relay this information. Which channel are you going to use? And some people propose the following. Let me use the channel I'm sensing for reporting. So your reporting channel and sensing channel are the same thing. Then if you sense someone, if you sense a primary user, and you try to report over that channel, that's bad because you will cause interference. So let me do it the other way around. If I sense someone, since I'm reporting over the same channel, I will keep silent. If I don't sense anything, then I will transmit. That's also another approach. But these are all different approaches. But note that cooperative detection typically implies better performance, but with overhead. This one works without any overhead. But this time, low uh, performance, especially in case of shadowing and multipath fading. But this, for example, the first non-cooperative detection could be better utilized in, for example, ad hoc, cognitive ad hoc networks. And this could be used for infrastructure-based going to radio networks. So for cooperative detection, we have a primary base station transmitting here. We have multiple cognitive radio users. One, where's two? Two is here, and three is here. There's an obstacle here between cognitive radio station two and the base station. And there's a primary station, a primary user that's trying to communicate with the base station. So when the primary base station transmits, this primary user hears, but due to this obstacle, cognitive radio user 2 cannot hear it well. Similar is true for cognitive radio user 1. That's shadowed by this obstacle. But cognitive radio 3 can healthily hear the transmission by the primary base station. Then the information from the cognitive radio user 3, although these two say, now there's no transmission, this one says, no, I hear it very well. OK, so you could, for example, benefit from the information uh, from cognitive radio user 3 to detect it better. But note, if you just do a simple voting, it's the vote of 1 against 2. If it was just bean counting, this one would lose it. So, even if you take all these measurements, your decision mechanism should be intelligent. Like, if, you, if this one says, I think there's someone, and I have a very good SNR value, you may give this one more weight than the others, so that you decide it's, uh, there's a transmission or not. Now, it is possible that, due to some reason, 
someone says uh, some one or more uh, sensing devices say there is a transmission and uh, some say no and let's say your fusion center finally decides there is really uh, there is a primary user actually there is none that's also possible okay that we call a false alarm there was really no transmission but that was an error in detection you concluded that there was a transmitter what happens in that case well you refrain from using that band is it good it's bad of course because it decreases your performance there was some available spectrum hole but you missed it it was a missed opportunity but at least you didn't harm a primary user that might have caused some quality of service degradation for the secondary network but at least you didn't harm the primary network the other case is where you conclude that there's no primary user actually there was one that would be a missed detection that is worse than a false alarm but typically what we would like to do is I would like to keep my false alarm rate or false alarm probability at a level and minimize, sorry, maximize my probability of detection. Okay? I can always come up with a, a detector design that will give me 100% uh, high, uh, let me see, 100% probability of detection. But the false alarm would be terrible. Or I can come up with a, another detector which has 0% false alarm rate, but it has a very high missed detection rate. Okay, so you'd like to somehow try to come up with an optimal solution or close to optimal solution that will make use of these. Anyways, uh, previously pay attention. These two concluded it was idle. This was this said busy. The fusion center, which is not shown here, uh, decides that it's busy. So it relays this busy information to the other two. So they also understand that they shouldn't be using it. Uh, the cooperative methods so provide more accurate sensing performance, but they cause overhead traffic, as we have discussed. Still, additional problem would be that primary receiver uncertainty problem caused by the lack of primary receiver location knowledge is still unsolved. Okay, going back in here, uh, if you, it is possible that you decide there is no, no primary user because all these three were not here but they were outside. Like assume that you don't have these here but you have them outside. So they will all say idle because they don't hear the base station. They're out of the coverage of the base station. But when they try to transmit, even at low power, in close proximity, if this one falls into that close proximity, still it will cause interference. So it doesn't solve that part. Receiver detection, we'll just discuss this for the sake of completeness. It's not. Uh, used much. Uh, typically, if someone is transmitting, a base station is transmitting, the receiver, at the receiver, the local oscillator causes some leakage. And it is theoretically possible to sense this leakage power. This is like, consider your TV station, TV set. It's not transmitting anything. Okay, it's just receiving. It's possible to detect if there's a TV set or not. Okay? But this leakage power is very low and it's quite difficult to detect it. You have to be very close to detect it. So uh, it's in practice, it's not very frequently used. So the cognitive radio users detect the uh, leakage power. 
uh, for the detection of the primary users instead of the transmitted signals and then this would solve the receiver problem but in practice it's not uh, doing very well. So same as the methods before as the match filter detection and uh, energy detection and uh, cyclostationary feature detection. Uh, primary receiver detection can solve the receiver uncertainty problem in the transmitter uh, detection. However, since this is very weak, implementation is not trivial and currently it's only feasible uh, for the detection of huge TV receivers, but then what do you do for your handsets? That's difficult. Another approach is the interference temperature management. In this case, uh, if you look at the power at the receiver, and uh, here the x-axis is showing uh, the distance of the receiver to the transmitter. Uh, the received uh, signal uh, from the licensed transmission would decrease with distance, of course. Uh, and there is a uh, temperature limit, uh, interference temperature limit, due to the interference from all noise sources in the environment. And as long as the noise is under this limit, it's fine. Of course, if your received signal is going beyond this limit, then it's not good. So I would like to keep this temperature limit, interference temperature limit, as low as possible so that I have wider coverage area. However, if I keep it too low, then noise would cause me misdetections and problems, errors in communication. Okay? So you try to find the uh, optimal uh, interference temperature limit, but given some limit, you see that this, these are the noise or interference from the environment, but you see there are some opportunities here. In other words, take it this way. If I were using the same frequency in the same environment, with the same, primary, uh, the same frequency with the primary user, if my transmission power is low, I could utilize these holes, right? Because my transmission would appear as noise to the receiver. The problem is, for example, here I detect some opportunity, so I try start transmission, but I never know when the noise will come. During my transmission, if also noise increases, then the sum of my transmission and the noise would exceed uh, the interference limit. In close proximity, to the receiver, that wouldn't cause a problem. But if I'm close to the cell boundary, or the signal uh, fades due to several reasons about the channel, if the received signal strength is close to the limit, and I add a little bit on that noise to exceed the limit, then that would cause problems with the primary user. So that was one of the approaches, but then FCC said, okay, forget it. It's, uh, in practice, it would be difficult to use. So this is yet one of the services. But still, we plan to use this, for example, in one of our projects uh, for some special purposes, this approach. Uh, the model now shows the signal of a radio uh, designed to uh, operate in a range at which the received power approaches the level of the noise floor. As additional interfering signals appear, the noise floor will now increase at various points within the uh, service area, uh, as shown by the peaks. And the model manages interference at the receiver through the uh, interference temperature limit, which is represented by the amount of new interference that the receiver can tolerate. In other words, the interference temperature model accounts for cumulative RF energy from multiple transmitters where you are one of those transmitters and sets a maximum cap on their aggregate level. As long as cognitive radio users do not exceed this limit by their transmissions, they can use it. The problem is, how do you know you won't exceed it? That's difficult. 
There, so there's no practical way for the cognitive radio device to measure or estimate the interference temperature. The uh, devices cannot distinguish between actual signals from primary users and noise and interference. And the limit should be, uh, the loc uh, should be location dependent uh, of the primary users, which is difficult to understand and know. So increasing the interference temperature limit will typically affect primary network's capacity and coverage. So that would be the end of our discussion today. Next week we'll, we will continue in more detail about how you do detection and more important, how you do cooperative detection and make a decision when you have multiple observations. That would be uh, mostly uh, the discussion of our work with my uh, former PhD student, now my postdoc, Birkan Yilmaz. I will check if uh, Birkan can be here also to do the presentation, otherwise I will do it myself. Okay, so that's all for today.